Hi, my name is Gary Schnell. I'd like to welcome you into my home near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Once again, where I've been doing a series of YouTube videos to highlight different areas of my recently published book regarding consciousness. Um, in that book, I talk a lot about quantum physics and relativity. And I wanted to take a moment in some extra videos to discuss some of the, the difficulties that people might have in understanding uh, these kinds of concepts. So I put together a, a previous vid video on uh, the four principles of quantum physics that uh, addressed um, the ideas of non-locality, uncertainty, complementarity, and, in, and entanglement. Um, I'd like to carry the metaphor a little further into a another um, element. Well, actually it's not another element, it's a related element. And it's this idea of non-locality whereby the bottle, um, as it was carried away by the waves, um, once it was out of the man's purview, was essentially non-local to that man. Um, and it remained non-local to anything, perhaps, until uh, the twins found it and it became local to them. Now, what I'd like to ask you to consider uh, is that um, the ocean, the water, is a metaphor for what we call non-local space. Now, non-local space has a variety of other names. Most commonly in the scientific literature, it'll be called the zero-point field. It can also be called the Akashic field in more of the uh, uh, psychic uh, phenomenal literature. Um, it can also be known as the implicate order uh, of David Bohm's. Um, but it has a variety of names. Um, and the idea of non-local space is kind of like, you know, what we have on the, the face of our earth um, with the different bodies of water that make it up. Um, Non-local space uh, is thought to perhaps make up about 73% of, of our universe. Um, essentially, the matter that we're so, um, so um, accustomed to makes up about 4%. Much of the rest of, you know, that 70, of that 23% is made up of something called dark matter. Um, in fact, this was uh, highlighted in a recently published book called The 4% Universe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the, the water on the surface of the earth, kind of like the uh, idea of non-local space, makes up about 75%, so pretty roughly the same amount, uh, the same uh, amount uh, on a percentage uh, basis as uh, non-local space makes up the universe. Um, and the water, uh, it is present in oceans, it is present in lakes, it is present in rivers, it, it is present in, in streams, and it is uh, present in springs that feed the streams. Um, so it, it, it pervades our planet. Um, well, the, the, there's, you know, 25% land, there's water in and through the land, underneath the land. Um, and that's kind of what happens with non-local space. Um, it is in and through everything. Uh, me, this board, um, everything, the uh, bottle of beer that I've been using. It just is in and through everything that, that uh, exists um, as a part of um, this universe. Um, now, within the, within the uh, uh, non-local space, um, there are information waves, and these information waves give rise to uh, what, what are called virtual particles. Um, the virtual particles pop in and out of existence. Um, they don't become part of, the, uh, part of uh, our space-time but they pop in and out of existence in, in, in non-local space. And they're called virtual because they are so fleetingly existent in our space-time. 
And the best way to understand this would be to consider that maybe there are just thousands of these Louis cherry bounces floating in the water by this guy. And of course, it's a little bit wavy, so he, he can't, um, he can't see all the bottles at once. They kind of bob up and down and up and down. They change position because the, the water's carrying them. And so sometimes some of the bottles are seen by the man and they pop out of existence essentially because he no longer sees them because the waves are making them bob up and down and then other bottles are seen and then he no longer sees those and then other bottles are seen and some of them are the same bottles he saw before but essentially he's looking at this this virtual bottle if you will pop in and out of existence as the waves carry it along and make it bob up and down um, and that's kind of what we're, we're talking about here, this, this, this idea of virtual particles. Now, we know these virtual particles exist, uh, unlike the thousands of bottles of Louis Cherry Bounce in the ocean. We know these virtual particles exist because of something called the Casimir effect. Now, the Casimir effect I've explained in, a, in another video. So what I'd like to do is... Um, continue with this metaphor that I'm using, and you'll recall that this is the island of identical twins. Well, these twins, all they've ever seen is the, the, um, the top of the water. They've never seen underneath the water. They don't know, you know, what's there, what isn't there. Um, all they're aware of is the ocean. And so they decide they're going to do an experiment to see if there's anything underneath, underneath that water. Um, and fortunately, this island of identical twins is quite an ingenious place. They've developed a, a universal food, if you will, um, kind of like Spam, but better tasting than Spam, even though that is the closest thing I can come to, to a universal food. Um, and so they decide to, they decide to, um, take this Spam and, put it in like a, a, a suet container, a big one, um, or two of them, as a matter of fact, um, so that if there's anything under the water that might be interested in eating it, it can get at it easily enough and, and eat away. So they um, take their boats and they go to different areas. They have a line between them. Uh, and hanging from the line are uh, two equal suet containers, um, and they're about, oh, uh, five meters apart as the, the boats, um, as the uh, boats are about uh, 10, 15 meters apart. And they, they hang the line between them and they drop the suet into the water. Now, about an hour later, they pull that suet up. They pull those two blocks of suet up. And what they find is that the, they're, they're, they're not in the same place anymore. They've, they've, they're closer together. Now, they think about this for a while and they say, how, how can this happen? You know, we, we put them in, we put them in, in uh, uh, perfectly uh, parallel to each other. We put them in five meters apart and now they're 4.5 meters apart. And of course, they notice that the food has been eaten uh, on both sides of the suet, although it may have been eaten more on the outside of the suet than the inside of the su suet, though that's not part of the Casimir effect. But that's and, and, and but they use that as evidence um, to help them understand. They figure that there, there must be something underneath the water that loves their universal food because everybody loves universal food. I don't know that everybody loves spam, but... Uh, so they figure there's something on the water that's been eating it. And because it seems to be nibbled at more from the outside than the inside, and because the two things, the, the two suet blocks are, are closer together than they were, they, they um, come up with the idea that maybe there are a lot of different sized animals under the water. Um, now, some of these animals are bigger and some of them are smaller. Uh, but because the, the suet blocks are only five meters apart, 
And because the outside of the suet box were eaten more, they intuit that maybe there are more big fish that couldn't get between the suet box and eat between the suet box um, than there are little fish. Or maybe not so much that there are more big fish, but there, there are big fish that couldn't get between the suet box. Maybe there's just the same number of little fish in between and, and outside, but the big fish couldn't get in between. So essentially what's happened is um, as the, well, I call them fish. These people wouldn't know them as fish. They're just animals. But uh, essentially what's happened is that the blocks were pushed together maybe as they, they think about it by the fact that there were more of these animals on the outside because the bigger animals couldn't get between the between the two suet blocks. Um, and that's kind of what's happening with the Casimir effect. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of, we, we, we put these two plates uh, in, in, a, um, in a vacuum and, and lo and behold, not plates, they're, they're thin foils. Lo and behold, what ends up happening is they, they come closer together as if they're magnetic, but they're not. Um, and what's happening is, is that the greater number of particles out, uh, there's a greater number of particles outside um, the, uh, the foils than there are inside the foils. And that in and of itself might push them together. But then if we think of the idea that maybe these particles are loops of string, which would be consistent with string theory, then there are maybe bigger strings um, that can't go in between the, the, the two um, thin plates um, and only the smaller ones can, well then maybe, you know, that uh, causes uh, the plates to come closer together as well. And so what I hope I've, I've done here is talked a little bit about non-local space. Now, the other thing to um, talk about with non-local space or the zero point field is it is it carries all of these particles but i want to emphasize that it is apart from space time it is beyond space time it is not within space time even though it permeates us and everything uh, that we know it is separate or apart um, carrying its information of virtual particles with it. So that that concludes this, this metaphor. I hope it's been enlightening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and I would appreciate any questions or comments that you might have. Um, you can um, type them in after this video is over. Thank you for your time. Uh, take care. Stay healthy in this day and age. Uh, be well. Thank you.